Hi, my name is Mike Capazello. I'm an engineering student at the University of Connecticut, and in this presentation I'll be discussing the bioremediation of chlorinated hydrocarbons. I'll be discussing what this means and how it's achieved. Some slight clarification may be necessary. Bioremediation is defined as the biological degradation of contaminants using microbial population, and although this can include several different processes such as land farming, bioreactors, and rhizofiltration, oftentimes bioremediation is referring to the two processes, bioaugmentation and biostimulation. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, when I say bioremediation, I'm referring to one of these two processes. As I defined in the last slide, the basic idea is that various contaminants can be removed from the environment using naturally occurring processes. For bioaugmentation, this means it uses microorganisms that are either indigenous to the contaminated site or introduced specifically for the cleanup to get rid of a pollutant. Unlike other processes that involve removing the contaminated soil and water from the site and moving it to clean it, bioaugmentation is done in situ, which means it's done at the site. The microorganisms break down hydrocarbons by using enzymes they naturally produce during their growth and respiration that then break down the hydrocarbons into other organic compounds that are environmentally safe. Although it's happening naturally, it's not nearly fast enough or grand enough to be effective in the long run. To speed up the process, the microorganisms are fed nitrogen, carbon, and or phosphorus, sometimes methanol, and this helps them grow faster and respire faster. As I mentioned earlier, this presentation is focusing specifically on bioaugmentation and biostimulation. And although the processes are similar, bioaugmentation is generally considered easier and more effective. Biostimulation specifically studies the organisms at the contaminated site, and then engineers attempt to promote the growth of these organisms on site. Bioaugmentation, although possibly utilizing the same types of microorganisms, feeds them and promotes their growth off-site and then introduces them into the site and monitors them there. Biostimulation can be ineffective because the nutrients aren't necessarily going to be received by the microorganisms they want them to be received by, so there's no guarantee that it's going to work. Bioaugmentation eliminates this possibility. Chlorinated hydrocarbons are simply hydrocarbons with at least one covalently bonded chlorine atom. Several very common forms are trichloroethylene, tetrachloroethylene, DDT, which was a very common pesticide in the 60s and 70s, and MTBE, which is still being used today as a gas additive. All of these are very toxic to people. Um, of all of these, TE is still considered the most common organic contaminant in the country. Trichloroethylene, or TCE, is a highly volatile chlorinated hydrocarbon, which makes traditional methods of remediating it, such as vacuum extraction or pump and treat remediation, very risky. When it's done ex situ, off-site, uh, the TCE can very easily escape into the air, and it's a very harmful air pollutant, as well as soil and groundwater contaminants. Although there are many microorganisms and bacteria being studied for the purposes of bioremediation, methanotrophs are by far the most studied and best understood. In general, there are 70 genera of bacteria known to produce enzymes to break down hydrocarbons such as oil and the ones previously mentioned. A methanotroph is an aerobic bacteria that uses methane as its sole source of energy. It oxidizes methane through the use of an enzyme called methane monooxygenase which is abbreviated MMO. This is a picture of methanotrophic bacteria that's glowing due to fluorescent antibodies. There are eight genera or subdivisions of methanotrophs that are then divided into two categories, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 follows the ribulose monophosphate pathway to assimilate formaldehyde and its membrane is composed of 16 carbon fatty acids while type 2 follows the serine pathway for the assimilation of formaldehyde and its membrane composes of 18 carbon fatty acids. For the purposes of bioremediation, the most significant difference between type 1 and type 2 is the different MMO they produce. Only type 2 has been observed to produce a soluble form of methane monooxygenase, abbreviated SMMO. When trying to remediate contaminated groundwater, 
Regular MMO works, but it's clear that SMMO is much more successful in reducing contaminants. Co-metabolism is the process where, in the presence of a primary compound which starts the metabolism process, enzymes will also start to metabolize the secondary compound. For methane monooxygenase, it will start to metabolize methane, and then it will start to co-metabolize any other organic carbon substrates that aren't part of the methanotroph's primary source of energy, which basically means it will break down hydrocarbons besides methane. This has proved a very effective method for dealing with TCE. This is a breakdown of the oxidation of methane and the breakdown of trichloroethylene. Another reason methanotrophs are advantageous is, aside from the SMMO, they work in aerobic conditions. The reason this is good is because in anaerobic conditions, TCE can partially break down and form carcinogens and toxins that are even more hazardous than its parent TCE. Bioaugmentation and bioremediation of a very bright future. Although the degradation of hydrocarbons has been happening for years, new inventive ways of using bioaugmentation has been happening, such as removing uranium from groundwater. This is working off the idea that U6 is a very soluble form of uranium, and by oxidizing it with microorganisms, it can turn into U4, which is insoluble and generally precipitates out in the form of uraninite or UO2. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. This is the list of sites I used, and I will now be accepting questions.